Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nesh Nikolic and my guest today is Piers Steele. He is a researcher and engaging speaker on the science of motivation and procrastination. He is a distinguished research chair at the University of, University of Calgary, where he teaches human resources and organizational dynamics at the Haskane School of Business. His research has appeared in several outlets around the world, ranging from Psychology Today and New Scientist to Good Housekeeping and The New Yorker. What was so enjoyable about today's interview was Piers' capacity to highlight how procrastination shows up in modern life and the related forces that make it so irresistible. I really appreciated Piers' Uh, knowledge on the topic and the nuances that he brought to today's conversation so that we can all understand it a little bit more and, and look at how it plays out in our own lives. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I uh, enjoyed recording. Piers, a big thank you for uh, coming in onto the show today and talking about you know, motivation, procrastination, and, and and the science behind that as well. I think it's something that is, you know, wildly uh, applicable in so many areas, and and certainly an interest for for me as well. Uh my pleasure, Nesh. What were we supposed to do this yesterday, though? We we were we were. I thought I think there was a bit of a glitch. So it's yeah, it's good that we uh, made it today. It's uh it's um you know it comes it 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 comes around and works out. So it's good to good to hear. Maybe that was a bit of you know motivational uh, challenges on both ends. Highly <laughs> appropriate given the topic, don't you think? <laughs> so tell me a little bit about let, 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 let's start with 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 yourself. How did you get into this space, and where does this interest come come from? Well, you know, a lot of it is research is me search. So uh, I was, grew up being a terrible procrastinator, just absolutely awful. Um, but by a combination of miracles, I did manage to end up in a PhD program for psychology. And one of the people I was TAing for, Thomas um, Brothen, was doing a online study one early one before MOOCs, before these massive open online courses, it was called a personalized system of instruction, not a computerized personal system of instruction. So the nice time date stamps of exactly when people are doing work. And it's a somewhat captive audience, so you can give them a lot of measures. And that was my first paper. And I kind of like, wow, you, you can study procrastination? You know, I, I was in love. And uh, so I made that my PhD in the meta-analysis. And all of a sudden, after a few attempts, because they expected to publish, um, I did manage to make it into a decent journal, Psychological Bulletin. And slow news day, you know, we were they put out a press release. And, you know, I, we were just having fun with it because we didn't think of it. It's not like today where, <laughs> where the, the need to kind of fine tune your social media presence is all, all important. Um, we just threw it out there and had some fun. So, you know, after, after 10 years, my three year study in procrastination and we've made a formula for it, you know, went around the world, right? So then there was book offers. And um, so I took one of them and I wrote a, a, a pretty decent book on it, uh, The Procrastination Equation. And uh, my real skills lie more in systematic review. So I'm really good at reading everyone else's work, finding the commonalities, the pieces, and putting it together. You know, um, I'm the guy who, I guess, 
who took Newton's advice to stand on the shoulders of giants. But pretty much, I will stand on the shoulders of anybody. It, you know, they all make you taller. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, that, that, that is probably some of the most you know, enjoyable work that I either, you know, uh, read or listen to, you know, consume these days is, 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 you know, people's capacity to, to bring together, uh, you know, the science and, and you know, what you know, others have, have established and put it in some sort of coherent way, because it's so hard to, to understand the space. Um, you know, I think. Oh, yeah. Plenty of people that that are you know extremely famous for it. You know, the, you know the likes of you know maybe someone like Malcolm Gladwell, um, and you know it, it, it sparks up you know questions and stories and conversations where you know other academics get to say, well, I don't quite you know think this is correct or not, and so on. But you know the fact that there's now a conversation about that makes it really exciting. So uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you know. What is the science? What what oh, does yeah, the data right. tell us? Uh, I, I differentiate myself from Malcolm Gladwell, um, aside from the size of our respective bank accounts. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, I like to put the science before the narrative. Sure, sure. No, I mean he's done very well in in putting out yeah, a, right. a, a nice. But he's, he's, he's an amazing essayist. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, your question was. Maybe uh, you could you could uh, you know begin with with uh, talking us through what what your you know what your research has has found in in reading you know others others work and and you know what is you know what what underpins you know these, these oh, yeah, that's spaces. Right. Well, the, the traditionally, and you, you can go back into like early ones. I was just looking at one from about the nineteen forty six where they were talking about connecting um, procrastination to anxiety. So it's kind of this, this, this uh, folk theory. And it ended up, you know, that there was some truth to it, but not the way you think. That people who are anxious or perfectionist or have this kind of neurotic type of procrastination, um, they tend to seek clinical help. So clinicians saw this lot of connection between procrastination and some type of you know, irrational beliefs, perfectionism, anxiety. So they said, "Wow, that's the cause." But it it was it was self selection to someone. So it turns out when we started doing you know just standard correlational surveys, you know, give somebody an anxiety, give them a procrastination. Time and time, we get weak to no results. Right? You, and you can even get a positive result with, um, or excuse me, you can even get a negative result between perfectionism and procrastination. But this was, you know, this is what we kind of, when, once we get some momentum behind an idea, <laughs> we tend, it tends to take generations. They say science um, advances one generation of time because People don't let go of the past ideas. It was not a bad idea. In fact, um, there is some early kind of fact around it, work by Solomon and Rothbaum. They gave a kind of a personality, basically personality scale for four procrastinators. They found there's this a very small type, only about 10% of procrastinators, but really coherent. So they really felt it this way that had anxiety as the cause of the procrastination. Much larger group was social, more extroverted. They said, they know it's because I like going out with friends. And you have, when, so the, the, our early kind of suspicions about how it works weren't that accurate. If we had to say one thing that does uh, correlate, and this is with comparative psychology, animal studies, correlational, Neuropsychology, it evolutionally makes sense. It's impulsiveness. Impulsiveness is at the root. And it's because it's temporal discounting. Impulsiveness is basically finding the now so much more beautiful than the later. So what happens is, is that we're all kind of beset with doing something that's going to give the rewards up front, something right now. That, you know, it could be anything from Oh, well, usually it's going to be something on your phone. 
tell you the truth. But it could be, yeah, it used to be television, people snacking, people going out with friends. And we did some historical um, analyses, seeing what people procrastinate about differed over the decades. But, you know, we're not going to, we don't need to go down those, those weeds, right? But um, ultimately, what you procrastinate about is determined by other elements of your personality, but the core of it is impulsiveness. So anxious people, yes, um, they procrastinate because they're trying to emotional regulation and control their anxiety. However, anxious people who are not impulsiveness actually start early because that's how they get rid of their anxiety, right? So it's not the anxiety, it was the interaction with impulsiveness. And um, that's why you didn't get that correlation. Right. Even and but it also explains why you saw a lot of anxious procrastinators. So phenomenologically, you know, you ask them, they said, oh, yeah, I feel anxious and I procrastinate because they are an individual and they don't see their own impulsiveness as a variable. It's just a constant from their side in the backwater. It's like the, the, the water for the fish. Those are the parts of our personality we can't see because, you know, we don't have another effective point of reference and it's like as psychologists you know over decades we built up this type of perspective outside of ourselves and be able to see people in a continuum and then along these different elements you know so you know most people don't have that advantage and um, the type of impulsiveness that you're talking about uh, would it be fair to define or not necessarily define you know, structurally but uh, uh give flavor to by saying it it's really about avoiding pain the 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 discomfort so if if you know the the, the classic study example you know someone going needing to persist through writing an essay or doing research writing a paper it, once it they, and, once and they usually meet something difficult there there's an there's an impulse to avoid the pain you know and it could be chores around the house or um you know but whatever it is any type of responsibility that, that that has a relationship for them to be painful or uncomfortable or unwanted yeah um mostly but not entirely you you can procrastinate simply because you're around a superior temptation so you know it's just marketing right it be the proximity price placement and all those p's that those marketers love to kind of what are the what are the other ones uh, I think those are the important ones for this case. Anyway, and the the uh, the temptation, the more easier it is to, to obtain, right? Because there is a kind of an equation that you can do this, which models it. Some people are said, no, we all the vastness of our personality cannot be explained by an equation. That's, well, I didn't say every detail, but you can get the broad strokes pretty good. So in this case, um it it is it's simply the 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 proximity to something that's more pleasurable and if you, it's really really available you know basically what you get is something called hyperbolic discounting and it just drives it through the the you know through to the stratosphere while so you're competing against this is the basic of the rub of it it's small it's um they call it the SS and LL in the scientific literature as a shortcut. Uh, sh small soon versus large later. So the small soon, because of hyperbolic discounting impulsiveness, it becomes much more attractive than larger later rewards. That's a bad thing for quality of life. So because what is small soon, that's usually vices and large later is usually virtues. So we tend to, you know, life, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, right? We tend to do these things that give immediate pleasures at the cost of our own longer well-being. In fact, the, the, the entire basically free market capitalism and online experience is weaponized to take advantage of this. You know, we live in a, in a uh, unescapable, uh, motivationally toxic world, really. You know, the, uh, and, you know, it, consequently, you'll never, as psychologists, you'll never be short of customers if you, if you decide to treat this. 
it is a it is it is it is a motivational um, pathological pandemic. So there's really uh, an environment that we're in today which is full of impulses in in terms of sorry temptations my apologies that that obviously attempting our impulse to yeah you know, and um, it's exactly and some people are more susceptible to it um the, the more distractible um especially i mean that's why it tends to be more rampant around people with adhd because of the distractibility so you know shiny there and so we have all the rings and things and um everything that's really almost trying to prevent us from getting in a flow state you know it's, almost... it's a it's an intentional economy really trying to get us to hey look at me do this now and they find it's very just very um is the quicker they can get that reward to you that dopamine squirt more powerful and more profitable they're going to be it uh, brings up the the uh, uh, the marshmallow experiment. Oh yeah, um, you know oh, that that yeah. uh, you know it's, it's so enjo- enjoyable to to watch because it it shows it from such a young age the 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 strength of an impulse and obviously yeah you know, the character trait differences within you know uh, children how you know some are able to somehow resist or delay that tempt- temptation for the reward of of an additional marshmallow if they you know uh, stay the, the the allocated time i don't know what the time was that was in the original experiments um do, do, was, uh, i remember there was a there's there a series of them right they, okay they tried it with cookies and pretzels and <laughs> they buried the food the very time <laughs> they were, you know, good 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 on for 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 walter for kind of taking that seriously and not just kind of can't <laughs> be marshmallow specific, but it's uh, but it's the the uh, I think it was five minutes. I, I'd have to look it up. The um, but yeah, there's also he was also looking at ways that what te- techniques that um, the more successful um, participants kids were using, and I think one of them always struck me was intentional. Um, reframing so they kind of um if you can this is something you push something into a symbolic stage and away from the limbic system so you put it more in the prefrontal cortex and it's harder for it to get the amygdala and really activate the cravings so you know they were pretending for example that um those little pretzels were logs or the marshmallows were clouds so they were trying to pretend the temptation didn't exist in front of them. It was, it was actually somewhat effective. Of course, a, we have a lot more. Sure. Than that. Yeah. And, and but, I know that there are at least, you know, correlations that were pulled out from that study, and I don't know how accurate they are, and maybe you can you can uh, in, in, enlighten me a little bit around that in terms of uh, your children that do have a greater capacity around you know, impulse control and self-regulation uh, uh, at least at, at particular stages in life were more likely uh, to also show that in other tasks you know that that it oh, kind yeah. of did generalize from from that to for example you know studying um, and and meeting other responsibilities that that um, there is almost a natural tendency um, now obviously we don't know what's happening at, at home you know whether those those virtues are being reinforced at home and the like, but 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 certainly um, that there yeah, is. Yeah, well, there um, was a whole yeah. They were there was a longitudinal where they tracked them and seen saw how many people, you know, went went on to uh, university or um, were involved in crime or early pregnancies and something along those lines. Yeah, and if you you think about okay, what's the root of of uh, of self-regulation, of conscience, a conscientious self-regulation, procrastination. They're all, you know, they all form a really tight forming cluster of self-control. Yeah, self-control makes a difference. It's doing the hard thing now, so you don't have to do the harder thing later on. And it, it's, it is very difficult 
for people to forgive themselves when they fail because they couldn't resist temptation or they didn't have this self-discipline. That's a lot of guilt in response to that. And yes, it's partly an individual uh, characteristic, but there's also skills you can get which can help. And there's also environment. And this is like, like um, any athletic ability. You know, if, you know, some people are born with higher energy levels and, you know, better eye-hand coordination, but you can also teach people to do better at that. And there's environments which, you know, encourage physical activities and those which do not. So it, it, it's, I, I kind of think uh, this almost seems to be always aligned with political positions. You know, the right-wing conservative always puts it down to the individual um, responsibility, and the left-wing always makes it environmental. And, of course, it's always a combination of both, right? Is, is, is the current world going out and changing our impulses with the volume of of uh you know temptations you know obviously the classic conversation these days is social media or our phones you know it's temptation to check your you know your phone whether it's email well, social I, media. I, would, I would put that question back to you do you think it would be absolutely mind-blowingly astronomically profitable for them to do so yeah, good, good, yes. uh, good answer. Right? Every yes there? Yeah, <laughs> they're doing it all right. Yeah, of course they are. It, it, it is, you know, it's also, it's how, also how AI and artificial intelligence and all these algorithms are designed, designed around consumption. It's, which is a, which is fine from a completely economic standpoint, because from economics, you know, which actually, they're actually quoting Socrates, they don't know it, but they are. And Socrates uh, said, man cannot willingly do wrong or knowingly do wrong. The idea is rationality, the assumption. The, that, you know, and if we, we only consume, we only do things that improve our utility, our, our, our life satisfaction. So that's the economic standpoint. So as long as we're consuming, we're happy, right? Um, I think that that works really well when you have um, a certain scarcity, a a you know food of, of and real vital needs, and you'll switch around in a pretty rational point. But once you have a, a super abundance, like we you most of us do in this day, it actually doesn't work that well anymore. It's a it's you know economics is really just an abbreviated model. You know, we wrote a paper about this, and, you know, the boundary conditions of the rational model. And economics is, um, I would say, the, the, the advantage is it makes things math, mathematically tractable. That's why economists like it. They're basically mathematicians. But is it, what's the verisimilitude? Does it actually describe reality? Well, sometimes yes. In a lot of situations, not so much. So when we actually kind of have this idea of, uh, of, of consumption and you're allowed to kind of push all of our buttons to get us consumed. So one way to think about it is, you know, I, I think about sometimes of our operating systems, our, 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 our wetware, our brains. They have, you know, when, you know, Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, you know, his next book was Brave New World Revisited, where we actually talked about how all the psychologists and marketers were going through and figuring out how to manipulate our behaviors. And this thing has really come to its fruition with big data. Since they have profiles of us all and they have custom algorithms to, to show us exactly not what our greatest temptation is though, um, because that would take us away from the screen. If we get what we wanted, we might be satisfied. What the algorithm is, is doing with, with the deaf, deafest of hands, the, the, the same type of care that allows it to beat any grandmaster, right? I think the, the in chess, 
is putting us um, temptations that almost satisfies, but leaves us a little hungry. So it keeps us going. You know, it's like the, the, you know, the bag of chips. You know, they calculated it to be fat, salt, and sugar and the perfect mouthfeel to make sure we continue eating. It's all about consumption. So, you know, and when Netflix came out, they found out when it was back in, people would get DVDs delivered to their households. They found that um, art house films, documentaries, got returned more slowly than, um, you know, rom-coms or comedies, right? And, and I've noticed this too, right? When I'm usually, you know, often some, some of these things I don't enjoy as much watching them, but I think about them repeatedly afterwards and they become part of my thinking and part of who I am. And, you know, and I reference it, and I tell other people about it. So it was, it was, you know, the, the, the enjoyment of it wasn't, was distributed over time, not just in the watching of it. That is disappearing now to these, uh, because of these algorithms about a consumption is about what you want. It, it, we're essentially, as I say, we're, we're trying to diet in, in a candy store, right? It's, the world is not setting us up to, for us to live our best lives. And it's chronic and it has terrible impacts across all of society. And it's a conversation, unfortunately, we're not really having. You know, they were making the world worse. Progress is now reversing. We're, we're eroding rationality. Um, you know, if, if There's a great book about this, too, called Enlightenment 2.0. So I recommend two books, my own and uh, Heath's book. He's a philosopher, political scientist, and one of those incredibly clear thinkers. And, you know, that's the way it's going. Hacks. Basically, the brain is easier to hack than to patch. So we're in the patching business, right? We're trying to help out and patch, but it's far, far easier to hack it. So the, it's lopsided unfortunately even even the delivery has made immense change you know not just the content that keeps you hungry the the way that it's delivered i know that uh, i've i've read about uh, i believe it was you know facebook when they made a a change to how the information was delivered so it didn't require you to get to the bottom of the page and then reload a new page and start from the top it allowed you to continue to just scroll. And so the the bottom of the page would um, you know, load up and you could just continue for an endless scroll. You could. You yeah. Know, and it's uh, for most people, this is the only reality they know. It's 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 the, the, the fact that anything was taken from them. They're not even aware of the alternative. So and when they, you know, while we. We, you know, I wrote a book about it. I we documented it. I even got in, involved in a few self-regulatory apps to try and help people out with it. And like Saint, and it didn't go that far. We found out that most people didn't want to get anything between them and their temptations. You know, it's a, a small percentage of the world that actually wants to fight against their vices. You know, you know most people are more than happy um, ignoring their own extended family's birthday, but knowing everything about the Kardashians, right? Well, but uh, much more better, better packaged lives, I would say, right? Much more interesting. The, the, and that's the way it, it is. We are... Our every vice is well, not all, well, not every vice, but most of our vices are are the free market system is more than happy to supply. I'm 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 assuming that also changes over age as well in terms of older persons, people who mature, they've been on this earth for longer, get a, a better handle on their self regulation, you know, yeah. control, impulse control, yeah. Yeah, the um, well, one thing is the development of the prefrontal cortex, which uh, you know 
for some people, it doesn't really finish off until the early 20s. So you get that. And prefrontal cortex, limbic system duet, that's really the seat of impulsiveness. Um, they kind of act as a single system, but if you really, you can tease them apart a little bit. You can have a strong limbic system and an okay prefrontal cortex, so a weak prefrontal cortex, and, you know, and you'll get the same type of results. And one's the accelerator, one's the brake almost. But it's the, um, but you can also learn as you go along. So self-knowledge, and one of the best self-knowledge is knowing that you're fallible. People who say, oh, I don't know, do you want to come down to the pub for a quick drink? He said, well, I would love to, but I know I'll never make it back and I got work to do. That's self-knowledge, right? The person who says, yeah, that'd be great. I'll just come down for one. <laughs> that is, <laughs> yeah, knowingly. Sure, you want another? I do want another. Two would be even better. I could do the work after two. Right. Yeah. So we have these little lies and conversations for self. Maybe we kind of learn almost through this extended temporal conversation with our past and future self, or these habits. So, and we get also get better at skills. And people read books and, you know, because they want to accomplish things and they aren't. And they see other people who are. So they, and, but not everyone figures it out. Um, I mean, and we're kind of archaic in a lot of our different self-regulatory techniques. I mean, one of the basic ones, and I, I, I say this because it's so common, it's, it's goal setting theory. But most people understand goal setting from that 1982 Greg Doran newsletter, which he, he penned the acronym SMART. And it's, you know, okay, I guess, for a first attempt, first attempt. But, you know, we're way better at it now, right? We know exactly, we've, we've reverse engineered when these goals work and when they don't. We know the specific circumstances. And we know a lot of these other elements, but they we don't widely distribute them through the world. And we're not, I, not really well trained in, um, in students or in high school. Though I, I see my own children's work and I can see there is there has been some advancements um about how to kind of how to to teach self-regulation but there's still ways to go mostly what, it's the environment what are some of the factors around goal setting that we know that that work that obviously you know beyond the you know smart acronym yeah i tried to find another great acronym i really did i tried to shout <laughs> and, I, and i tried csi approach and i think oh, okay i'll go with the csi um one is challenging um, this is kind of deals with goal commitment. You want it to be large enough to be meaningful, but not so small as to be easy. And this is, depends upon how you feel and the time and the goal. Sometimes a 10 minute goal is what you need. You know, sometimes uh, a, but doing all of life as 10 minute goals is tedious. Sometimes you say, what's my daily goal or weekly? Depends upon you. It's something you can commit to. Um, you want it to be specific. Do your best goals. Do not work well. You want specific really engages the limbic system, which likes things concrete and something can smell, taste, hear. Um, the other one is the S. Yes, the other one is immediate. Um, like actually, sometimes you can do specific immediate. They get together. Sometimes you can just combine them too and think of line of sight goals. So something tangible within the immediate distance that I can see to accomplish. And you know, this is like for writers, it's like 500 words or a thousand words, or sometimes it's time or process, like three hours. I'm gonna work three hours or two hours today on this. And time blocking and time restriction combines well with that. These are all little variants. The the truth is there's like 10,000 motivational theories out there. And they're all, believe it or not, trying to describe the same thing, us. And there's a lot of overlap. And we just have so many different terms and refinements for the same. And the last one, this is important, um, approach. The CSI approach. It's something you're trying to do. If, for example, somebody's trying to diet and said, well, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying not to eat 
sweets and chocolate. Like, whoa, that's that's a now when you try not to do something, you gauge an ironic process. So you it's like it's like not thinking about that pink elephant, right? So now you're only thing you could you could you could not eat the only thing you're gonna think about now is what you're not supposed to eat. Best to make it approach. Also, because if you don't make it approach, how can you soon be not be doing something? Right? You want to soon, you want to have something you're soon doing gauge hyperbolic discounting. So basically you take a distant goal, which has because of so much time between now and then, it's it's well undervalued, and you put it closer. And because if you're impulsive, you're just now making the goal that works well for you. So impulsive people respond well to nearby goals. You make the goal nearby. And you just said that's the major element. And there's those other tweaks I mentioned, which really help. So yeah, it, it, it's it's the way we're designed. Mm. Um, there's lots of there, I like that one about Joe Simpson and you know, who fell off the side of a Peruvian mountain and he managed to on a broken leg and he managed to get back to base camp by a series of 10 minute goals. You know, it's superhuman. Like, um, I think he lost 30, 40 pounds. You know, went into delirium, but he kept moving. And it's like, how did you make goals? Mm. It almost also talks talks about uh, the scarcity uh, component when when impulsivity is, you know, quite functional and useful is when there's scarcity, it, it, it's needing to you know, almost barge your way to what there's not going to be available and there tends to be a functional component there. But when we live in a, a world of abundance, uh, you know, being able, you know, it's still still being impulsive and, and, and grabbing the immediate, you know, uh, in, in at least lots of contexts is, is very you know, harmful because the world is designed <clears throat> from a consumerism perspective to say, right. it's, it's, you know, lots of shiny things around. I, I and you're right. I, I usually when I'm in conversation, I, I try and ha if you want this to continue, first step is usually getting people to forgive themselves. If they have too much guilt or emotions about their own kind of procrastination or other vices, they're not really willing to get a conversation about it because they want to escape from it. They want to escape from those bad feelings. So you've got to have start some for some self. Um, forgiveness and to that end I usually we usually have a conversation um, about you know we're an unbroken line of over you know a million generations of survivors and we you know that thing that Joe Simpsons did we can all do we we are all capable of superhuman feats it's just our environment is designed now to take advantage of these elements. If we were in a, a what they call the environment of evolutionary adaption, you know, hunting, gathering, we'd fit perfect, we'd be amazing. And we come along an energy source. Oh my gosh, this is high in fat and sugars. We should eat all of it. That's And that's exactly what you should do because food is trying not to be eaten or is trying to eat you. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to get enough calories. So you've got to be thinking about every element. So that's baked into us now. And it works work perfectly since forever. But now when you have super abundance, we, we aren't designed for that. We've changed the environment. We ourselves are great. We've changed the environment so we no longer really fit in it. We've changed the environment so really our purpose is um, simply to be to consume we're consumers it's not much of a life how how do we as 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 as, as psychologists you know try and begin to look at this now obviously you know we understand the you know, the you know impulse uh, versus you know, delayed grat gratification but what are some of the what what does the research you know say about you know how do we practice this train this understand this how do we try and and you know, not follow 
this internal urge that is constantly being, you know, fired and 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 you know, triggered. You know, that environment continues. You know, the classic one for for most of us is we've got an environment that's constantly saying, "Eat me." You know, the food abundance, the sweetness, the all yeah. the the flavors are, are constantly yelling out at us. And you know, it's, it's no no surprise that you know with that comes a lot of health problems that we've got. You know, increasing obesity rates. Um, you know, and if we just think about even just just how many of us are in the overweight range, you know, forget the obesity of of, of that of that you know extreme end. You know, the, the 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 BMI levels, and you know, it almost looks like when you see someone who's thin, they almost look like they're sick because everyone else is is is, is largely like, gosh, they they're skinny, but in actual fact. They're within the regular BMI that yeah, regular BMI. Science has told us that yeah. they're they're in a good state. We're like, gosh, somebody's, somebody's like, uh, oh my, gosh, I'm in great shape. And you go on, and you find you are just barely within the high end of normal. <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> mm-hmm. I thought I would be doing better. Yeah, I know the um, and uh, well, one thing I I would say is if for the, you have to understand. The yes, impulsiveness is the core of this. You have to treat that, <clears throat> and you can you can treat it right away. I mean, when I was doing the book, I cataloged twenty four separate techniques. I think I'm up to more like twenty eight, twenty nine right now. So I got I got a few new ones since then, but um, that also expands to other elements: the, the, your expectancy, your self confidence, your self efficacy, and value. We tend to put off things that we find boring. Um, and you kind of think like uh, some people, for example, get who are high in disagreeableness. They have high needs for autonomy. Um, they would experience anything that um, is directive or telling them they have to do it as aversive and would put it off. And, you know, you can say, oh, they're reestablishing the autonomy. Or you could say, yeah, they don't like being told what to do and having to do that, so they put that off because simply the value. And sometimes that people, um, I've had discussions with with people who are highly disagreeable about this, and they said, no, it's all demand resistance. And I say, yes, for you, right, for you. They know for every. Why do you say that? You know, <laughs> no, it's for you. So, and then there's the there's fun things like paradoxical treatment. Which um, you know, you tell them to procrastinate. <laughs> okay, now you have to procrastinate. No, I won't. <laughs> okay, we kind of like uh, yes, reverse psychology sometimes does work, um, but that's a that's a rare case. Well, for most people, you're going to be addressing yes, their impulsiveness, but you're also going to check whether their self confidence. You know that old adage say, which is a bit of hyperbole. If you think you can, if you think you can't, right? Um, usually, actually, um, yes, there is a component. If you think you can't, um, you are have less motivation, and if you have less motivation, you're more likely to put things off. And if you find it boring, you're more likely to put things off. So you can talk about how do we can adjust these things, improve it. That can be part of a therapeutic session too. You know, why do you feel this way? And it could even become like, you know, vocational counseling at some point and saying, you know, the, you know, you're, you're going for something you intrinsically dislike and expecting that not going, it's not to affect your motivation, right? The world and you do not work this way. And you can have these conversations or you could say, why do you see it this way? Why don't you perceive it in a different way? And we can have those conversations. And, you know, you can do a whole bunch of elements to improve people's self-confidence. But you're right. It, the, the biggest part is going to be the environment and outside in. So, and one thing is proximity of temptation. So one thing right off the start is, um, I said, does the person bring electronics into the bedroom when they need to go to sleep? Okay. Um, which means, of course, they're going to be staying up later because that's what it does. And it means they're going to be more tired the next morning. And the more tired you are, lower energy levels, that's a good predictor of procrastination. 
So a big thing right now is bedtime procrastination and it's spiraling and cycling because the more you procrastinate, the more tired you get, the more you tech, the more tired you get, the more you procrastinate. So how just being able to think about, okay, what are your temptations? Not, you know, instead of focusing on what people aren't doing, focus on what's pulling them away from the behavior and seeing if you can make that a little bit less accessible. And sometimes a very small change, like um, grayscaling your phone, so taking away the colors, or having two logons to your computer. Computers are great, but the problem is that you can do everything on them. When you really only want to do one thing works. So you have a second persona that people go to. I mean, they have to log out of their work persona on their computer and go in their play persona. And, you know, maybe put in a little, like, six-digit password or something. And these, that'll take people, like, 20, 30 seconds to do. And they won't do it, right? Um, you know, proximity to temptation is a big determinant. And you can do it the other way, too. I mean, if somebody wants to exercise and said, well, do you go home from work? He said, yes, I, I do. And I grab my bag and I end up watching TV. Yeah, home is where you put all your fun stuff, didn't you? Because it's your home. And now you're there and they're calling to you. If you'd stop by the gym on the way home from work, right? Or at least, you know, maybe you don't want to. Maybe say, hey, go in, park your car in front of it, um, get out of the car, you know, walk around it a couple of times, and then make a decision. The gym's right there. If you still don't want to go, then go, right? It's probably not the right day for you. But I'm guessing most of the mm. time, a lot more times you will. Right? There are sensible things we can, order of operations that we can do things to have a more successful life that are not onerous. They're just, you know, wise. That's that classic, you know, idea of <clears throat> someone who's trying to work on their weight is to, remove the temptations out of the cupboard right. you know they they obviously have all the opportunity they can just jump in their car drive down to the local service station you know and 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 yeah convenience and get, store and get, buy whatever they like but they don't replacement behaviors you want to snack you know carrot sticks and apple slices you know and you know that's the way i used to do it and i they would be right there right so if i could have a choice i could either have this which is a you know they're nice carrot sticks, by the way. I I, I shelled out to get the good ones. <laughs> and um, But they're right there. Or I could get up and go and get something else. Most of the times, I'll choose what's convenient. And that is what I made convenient. I, not a lot of, that wasn't willpower, it wasn't virtue. It was just, you know, was taking advantage of my laziness, really, more than anything. Well, this is how our our grocery stores are are, are changing. You know, uh, instead of buying you know, a, a lettuce head, you get lettuce that's already pre washed and pre chopped, and you know it's in a bag. And so, you know, they're going like hotcakes, and 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 people are you know reaching for. I mean, that's convenience, right? Convenience well, yeah, sells and, and, impulsiveness, and right? And you'll find um, everything we've talked about thoroughly baked in the design. A, the you know what levels the shelves you pay extra to kind of get at that harm level because people are people oh that's all the way at the bottom forget that's an extra two seconds right? the too too hard to get to you know the uh, they have you found out like anything behind a door sells like half as much as if you was you know, the door wasn't there and you just really cranked up the air conditioning. If you've got this, grab it. Or um, if you take a look at it, what is what are they advertising on these boxes and cans? It's the immediately consumable qualities, not the long-term nutrition. All these these are things you have to look and read if you want it. You know, and the color. It, it it's a. They say that um, if you go to a and why do they put milk at the back to force people to go through? They really are trying to channel people through the aisles the package good aisles hey some people say yeah if you go to the grocery store just go around the outside 
just don't go in the in, inner aisle. That's the, the, those are the aisles that get you. You'll be trapped in them. Oh, yeah. That's, it, it, it's everything designed with a lot of praxis, as they say. It's, where uh, else do you see? Where else do you see? Because obviously you've got a a you know sharpened eye for this in in. You, know, you you must observe the nature of how the psychopathology of everyday things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, where well, it's I mean, candy by the checkout counter. Why do you think this scratch lotto tickets are there? You know, all about impulse purchases to get things available. You know, where the the um, all the rings and dings on people's phones. The, really, these principles are just 1950s behaviorism. It's the, the, there, I looked at a close study of gamification and there was nothing new there. It was just the, how well they were being um, implemented is what differs today. It's the same principles. It's just, they're implemented really well. It's like a, you know, it's a difference between a, uh, I think a coca leaf and, you know, clinical grade cocaine. I imagine. I imagine I have not had neither. Sure. <laughs> but you, you're, you're, you're right. It's become so sophisticated that that you know we 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 can see everything that we're trying to get people to stop doing. We create friction around. You know, this is why you can't find a phone number for most large companies. They yeah, they right. just don't give us a phone number. It's in the fifteenth you know web page that you've got to click in a certain order to to, to find. Yeah, and um, all these. Tech millionaires and billionaires don't let their own children use their own products, which is very, very telling. It's like a, any any pusher, any drug pusher, you know, it, that's it's that's for the consumer, not for us, right? So yeah, and this is the nature of our reality. This is nature is everyone's reality, so it, but it didn't have to be this way, and it doesn't have to be this way forever. Um, I don't know when it's going to change but we understand exactly how, how it could change right we understand how design could be we can understand how to design things so we're, we're at the center so instead of consumption it's quality of life we can design the algorithm the algorithms would do anything with any criterion like and it's you're designing it like in a kind of consumption criterion you could design them you could train them on, do people re report higher um, life satisfaction? And they've shown it works. I mean, there was a beautiful one in San Francisco where they used it to AI to kind of indicate whether it was a warning signs of suicide. And then did targeted advertisements to people they felt, you know, fit this profile and suicide rates went way, way down. They ran out of money, of course, after a while, but they showed it was possible, right? quite clearly, and there was no follow-up to it. We, we are ruled by, you know, if profit, not by quality of life. That's, and the sad thing is, is that most people accept this reality as it's presented to them. Is that part of the challenge of, of you know, whether it's trying to create an, an app that addresses these things or, you know, it, it, it's hard to commercialize and it almost therefore requires you know, a, a government program that, that, that says, you know, we're redistributing our taxes toward these things because we see them having a, a societal, you know, impact and then hopefully, you know, also a commercial impact for them so that it, it, it does, you know, it's rewarding for them to do so. Well, yeah, I and mean, there, there's a lot of simple things we could do. I mean, one is, uh, you know, designing the operating system and the internet so these self-control techniques are easily available and they're just baked into them. You know, that, you know there's, there's authors out there who actually go in and have their, their Wi-Fi and modem burnt out. Right? Or you have to do an expensive like aftermarket upgrade to prevent yourself from getting that. Why aren't these things built in? The other one is actually who controls our data. I mean, there once was a time within my own living memory where privacy was something we prided ourselves on, and it was, you know, 
in fact, you know, like uh, when the first commercials came on, they didn't want them to be commercials. They said, I can't, we can't go into people's living rooms while they're listening to this and hawk a good, right? That's that's beyond the pale. So they had um, like their their speakers being olive palm for palm olive, right? And, you know, trying to subtly kind of like cue people, you know, hey, hey, this is brought to you by the palm olive hour. Just you're, just you should know we're supporting. subliminal stuff. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> It's a bit of, and now it's just right there. So what, as long as we don't have control of our information, it's going to run these algorithms. And the other part is, as long as we don't pay for these things, if we get them for free, we're not going to be the people that these products are servicing. They're actually, they're servicing advertisers. So they're saying, how can we bring people to the advertisers? And that's essentially we're the fuel, right? We're we're not the customer at all. We're we're not paying for anything, right? So what's our role in this? You know, it, it, it is sheep to be sheared. The uh, but we get it, and so you know, there's no the one thing I do agree about with economists is that there's no free lunch. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like part part of of the equation that uh, is important is trying to bring this conversation forward is, is for people to be able to observe how the world is built so that they can examine that component after the CSI, which is approach that that we have to find our own individual approaches. Uh, and similarly, obviously, you know that doesn't take away from. You know that left position, which which says there's probably importance for regulation for you know uh, uh, large organisations to also consider how they're servicing the community. Um, and 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 as a as a collective, I'm putting up my hand, going out and saying, well, you know, within my own life, I'm putting things incredibly accessible, you know, and they're the things that I don't want, but I'm putting them in my life. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, maybe government type of intervention which which goes out and says you know for example in australia it says we're going to send everyone over 50 a bowel cancer test and make it really really accessible and we're going to do it repeatedly which hopefully means that higher numbers of people you know test themselves uh and you know we'll run a campaign so they're doing it in both directions to try and get you know a better yeah, quality right. of life so it's yeah and, and making it easy is should not be kind of underestimated the, that's got to be the biggest thing right the the, the ease like convenience the I, I mean you you i think you know, you, you say it very very well in terms of the you know the proximity to temptation and and the ease you know that, that if it's easy we just do it well it, when, once you get into this you almost become get into public policy because you start thinking about all right instead of just for one individual how can we can address this issue all at once and then you start really realizing that very quickly that the the models that a lot of public policy um, is based upon are incredibly crude. They're based upon an, a, some type of, um, uh, of almost juvenile understanding of human nature. And right? they don't, you know, there's there's different. Some of them are a little bit more sophisticated, but uh, most of them are not. And we're coming to grips with that. The like, what's going to happen very, very quickly is that content will not just be selected for you algorithmically. But we are, I mean, we're at the cusp. I mean, by the cusp, I'm talking about in the next 12 months, right? Maybe 18. That, I mean, really within the year, the um, being able to create at least in the basics of videos that are designed for you. So we'll have an avatar, and it'll look like me or it'll look like you. Um, it'll be computer generated. It will speak whatever text you want it to. And we'll have any type of background. And so right now we have the capacity to make that avatar. We have the capacity to generate the text with all these new um, GPT-3, and then there's going to be GPT-4 and GPT-5. 
and we have the capacity to create the imagery. Right? And from the imagery, it's you know, little kind of tweaks to you know, make them a little bit more interactive. What happens then? I mean, when if you thought the level of disinformation and distraction was high now, and it, we it will get even higher. Mm. Um, can we have a functioning liberal democracy under these conditions? I have my doubts. Right? I have. I have. I'm not as optimistic as other people. So, I mean, you can talk about all these things, but until we get back to the fundamentals um, and, you know, try and kind of design conditions where people can make better choices. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's economics. If you consume it, it's good. So, you know, yeah, where yeah. we are right now. Peace. That's, that's, that, 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 that's quite scary uh, because I know how, visceral our responses are on a visual perspective this is why thumbnails you know are uh you know tracked and, and and used so much by your youtubes and your facebooks and 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 the like to go out and instigate who's going to click you know the clickbait whether it's a headline well the visual is even more powerful and and yeah. a video <laughs> my God, like a, to have well, a video, um, and I, as you say, you know, with GTP three and you know four coming on, yeah. and you know other versions, the photorealistic sort of component, and also to trigger me, you know, if I have a a, a propensity towards you know nature, I will likely want a nature background with you know someone who maybe yeah. you know, it looks like they connect with nature, and all of a sudden they're you know whatever they're saying resonates more um, because they're my type of person you know it's yeah, just... and, but you we all like things a little more extreme and that's going down the rabbit hole which is um what i i'd say what i worry about and if you ever watch um you know uh westworld you know it's a dystopian science fiction but in the, the i think in season four the ai finally wins so, um, and it controls basically people's beliefs so thoroughly, they can't even think about rising up, you know, in actions. That is one possible outcome. Once the, you know, the forms of if everything you see and presented to you is controlled by somebody else, and it's personalized to you and it's attractive, it's over. You know, we won't ever get a um, enough societal will or consensus to do anything about it, right? It's um, it's done. And I mean, we might consider ourselves, you know, the last of the free people. That's, I worry about that. Right. There's so many applications to 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 what you talk about, and you know, obviously starting at the very beginning around motivation and and, and procrastination, and looking at you know our classical behaviorism, and but how fine tuned it's become is yeah, is, exactly. is is incredible with you know with data and and um the level of of nuances that commercialism has has used to put it in an incredibly convenient and proximal place for us to go out and reach for and whether that's information or whether it's products you know the way that we interact and behave with the world um you know it's certainly very enlightening uh, to talk to you today and and really kind of look at that and, and also for for us to all begin to consider you know how much does it play i mean i i think i've already have a leaning in that direction but uh you know some of the things we've discussed today you know enhances that and and kind of says i've got to look further you know i've got to take a deeper dive um because everything is placed well, not everything but you know so much is placed uh, 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 so deliberately you know they, they, they yeah. are not by accident yeah it's the built world and there's almost nothing about it that hasn't been created with design yeah. um if you liked it, I did write a book about it. And there's even an Australian version. 
um, where I kind of make that, I think you call your spring break schoolies or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. I made those adjustments, right? So it's the, uh, it, and it's quite good. And uh, if you're interested in um, scholarly to get a little bit more information about this, I have the world's most searchable name because it's only one of me in the entire world. <laughs> So you can shoot me an email and I'll send you out over some of my literature. Yeah, there's a, one of the nice ones is actually from the Australian, um, Australian psychology. Um, and that is probably the more clinically aimed one. And I can send that to. What is your contact details? And can you tell us about the book again, where we can get it? Oh, okay. Well, it kind of looks like, I'm not sure if you, I think yours is much more orange. This is like the Canadian version. It's not going to show up that well. The, pro, the procrastination equation. The procrastination equation for a visual component. And can um, we get it with, within easy reach and temptation on Amazon? Yeah, you can get it. <laughs> yeah. Leave me a good review, please. The, uh, it's, you know, you can't, the, I wanted to you do an update to it because I have a lot more in my, um, Publisher asked me how many followers I have on Twitter. And I said, you know, I don't do that. Right? The, uh, and so uh, then no second book for you, right? Um, so we kind of, that's the problem with this. As you can see, you can't um, reach people without being part of the problem. Mm. Very, very enlightening, and and yeah, thank you so much for 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 your time and 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 obviously bringing these conversations to 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 the fore. I think they're important. You know, as psychologists, you know, I, I know I'm always thinking about how we view the world, and you know, I, I think it's important that we see different perspectives, and 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 this is certainly one that I don't think we're so conscious of and 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 to to see the deliberateness of of how the world is 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 structured and and therefore how we can uh maybe too strong a word fight against it but maybe it's not maybe we actually do need to be quite quite um you know deliberate ourselves and 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 push you know quite quite hard against it because it's it's pushing so heavily on us all the time yeah and i I would say people should be a little kinder about themselves Mm. when they do Collapse. You know, it is a trillion dollar industry aimed against you. Um, you're going to make you can, but there's still some areas of agency and autonomy you can do to reduce that. Right. Do it. Piers, thank you. And yeah, appreciate your work. Okay. Bye now. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review subscribe share it via social media and tell others about it start a conversation it's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.